Welcome to the Low Carb USA podcast, where we seek to inspire you to help us build this community. I'm Doug Reynolds. And this is Pam Devine. Well, thank you everybody for joining us on this uh, new episode. Um, we're really excited to have our good friend Karen Parrott join us. We met Karen way back in the first event in 2016, I believe. Um, and she lives locally by us, so we're so fortunate to have her be able to come join us at our free local community meetings, um, go to social events and have dinner, and also she's been on our volunteer staff. I think it wasn't intentional the first year that you volunteered, Karen, in 2017. You just said, looks like you might need some help because it's gotten kind of busy, Doug, um, and I can help easily. So uh, 2017, 18, and 19, I believe you were on our volunteer staff. So please, everybody welcome Karen Parrott and we'd love for her to tell her story. She has a very powerful journey um, of healing and health. Thanks for joining Karen. Thank you so much, Pam and Doug. I just want to say thank you for uh, creating the space and the place here in San Diego County. I think it's super important for local people to be able to meet with other local people. So thanks for starting the conference here. It's also very convenient for me. I you know, work full time and, and I have drive from San Diego County to Orange County, but to be able to have a conference where I can just drive down and keep costs low and get to meet so many important people. Uh, gosh, I, I've just really appreciated the uh, convenience and then meeting local people as, long, as well as at Low Carb USA San Diego, just all the famous people. I've, I've met Dr. Finney, Dr. Volek, uh, just Jimmy Moore. We met um, Dr. Ifland, who I ended up working for for a couple of months to get her more uh, in touch with the low-carb community. So it's just been a really a growth, time of growth for me, and I really want to give back. I want to give back. I, I know when it all started for me when I was about six years old, and I'm 53 now, so that was about... 1972, 73, around kindergarten or first grade. I know I did start to um, kind of use sugar or not really have an on off around sweets. And uh, back then, it, most people were uh, um, a normal way, a normal BMI. Um, and it was very frustrating throughout elementary school. Um, at the time, there were only chubby clothes at Sears to buy. And um, I was told a couple of times, hey, you're, you're uh, phasing out the chubbies and you won't have clothes to wear. So uh, back in the early 70s in the US and the Midwest where I grew up, though a lot of people sewed clothes. So uh, I was able to have homemade clothing made for me. And things did start to change. I grew up in a semi-rural area with a Christmas tree farm in the background, and there were cornfields out in front of us and, and some rural places where we could go outside and play, and that was expected. So I also traveled a lot with my family and got to hike the Grand Canyon when I was in fifth grade. And uh, that also, uh, I started jogging about in sixth or seventh grade, and that helped me get outside and get active. And then I went on a diet, which consisted of grapes and graham crackers and lemonade all one summer long. It wasn't great, but I did lose weight because it was calorie restricted. But it was 1980. I, I remember Luke and Laura were getting married on General Hospital for anyone in the U.S. You, and you're older you <laughs> or middle age. You might remember that. But in any case, I didn't feel good. I felt like, you know, in the hot Indiana heat, I was uh, starting to pass out or wanting to pass out. Of course, I didn't know anything about salt or low carb. And um, as I was getting older, too, I still struggled with it. But I went to uh, medical technology school in the mid-80s and uh, studied biology and chemistry. And so it made sense from a disease state where you learn in medical technology, you learn about all the different uh, vitamin deficiencies, the biochemistry issues that uh, kid, kids might have if they have inborn errors. So you really do learn a lot about uh, the biochemistry of eating and it, but it never dawned on me that those things were connected maybe with what I was doing. So flash forward to right before I, got pregnant with my daughter, I had her in 2000. 
I was overweight. I was about 60 pounds overweight. I was in my early 30s. I was a few years past having Hashimoto's disease. I had a big goiter and worked with the lab who tested thyroid uh, titer levels. And the uh, medical director at the time saw me and he goes, I see your thy I see your goiter. I said, I know a doctor's not treating me. He goes, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> We're going to get you treated. So he ran the test. He saw me saw me as a patient, ran the test, and of course I had 1 to 80 antimicrosomal antibody titer, which the, the lab was uh, thrilled about because <laughs> they could use me as a, as a good control. And then my, the medical director was thrilled because he could tell I wasn't feeling good and, and I could get treated. And I've been on the same dose of thyroid medicine ever since. So that worked out well. But uh, I lost about 60 pounds at a, a points counting sort of scenario where it was just a food restriction, some movement. Uh, I was doing a lot of walking at the time. And it did, it did help me because I had a pregnancy where I got pregnant when I was at a normal weight. And um, I, I you know, worked in the COAG lab. I know sometimes that can be risky for different people based on your genetics and your family history and, and so on and so forth. So um, after that, though, I had a hard time losing some of the, the baby weight. And then I also became sensitive to dairy. And I didn't know it, but I was also sensitive to gluten. And so I went through probably 10 or 12 rounds of points counting, and it just wasn't working anymore. So... It, uh, it was a hot, hot day, and I knew that I was 70 pounds overweight at this time, and I had a small kid at home. She was about three years old, two to three years old, and I knew it was going to start affecting my job, and then a former supervisor, he passed away from health complications at age 48. I was for age 46, and I just felt like it was 100 degrees at work because it was inland Orange County, so hot. And it's like, I'm going to be next. I'm going to fall over someday. I'm so young. My daughter's so young. And, and um, right around that time, too, I became a, you know, co-parenting. So a single mom, but with co-parenting. So I was able to uh, do a, a uh, uh, out-of-the-box diet plan that was low-carb but low-calorie, too. I was on it for 40 weeks, like a birth in reverse. So I lost 70 pounds in 40 weeks, but I, that was right around the time of the paleo heyday. And I went to uh, read the books. There were only a few paleo bloggers at the time um, who were sometimes low-carb. So as I was going along that route, when I switched off the package plan because it was expensive, I didn't want to do that long term. And with paleo, I was able to get grains, sugars, and dairy out. I did a, a, a 30 day challenge where I took dairy out. And then a couple months later, I realized I was still binge eating a little bit with uh, nuts. So I did a 30 day challenge with nuts. Also around this time, Terry Walls, Dr. Walls was uh, writing about the Walls protocol and MS runs in, in, in my family. One of my parents had MS. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to make sure I didn't know, you know, if, if, and it was, I was around age 48 of my parents' diagnosis. So I didn't want to eat foods that would be inflammatory. Uh, so what I realized is as I was, as I was wanting to weight maintain, I wanted to document my story. So I have a blog at blogspotgardengirlkp.com and I started writing about it. And I also realized how much, how important it was to abstain. So I'm kind of what, um, I know Gretchen Rubin has four types and I'm an upholder. So I really, really was committed to just keeping my new clothes, keeping the weight off. I had yo-yo dieted for 40 years. That's four zero. And that's such a long time, four decades. It's such a long time. So I committed to doing whatever it would take. And so I abstain now from dairy just because of the post Hashimoto's, from nuts because they're binge triggers. And then as I was doing elimination back and forth, I did discover guar and xanthan gum were problematic. So I removed those, although soy lecithin that you might find in 85% chocolate, 
that works just fine. So what I did then is I uh, read a lot of materials of, about um, uh, food addiction. And back in the day, I didn't have the resources that Dr. Ifland, I know you interviewed her recently. And she has a whole huge, huge textbook uh, with lots of scientific references. And I kind of did what she recommends in the book. So that was basically life-saving for me. I, I, I don't know how many more cycles uh, I was right at pre-diabetes, which is diabetes, uh, before I stopped with uh, the sugars and the grains. So uh, that is my story. I'm into being about eight plus years of what I call food sober living. And then I've been keeping the weight off for almost eight years. This is seven and a half. And I just feel fantastic. I'm 53. People see pictures of me. They don't believe that when I was 48, I... I or 46 rather, I looked like that. They say I looked 10 or 15 years younger. So I just want to say thank you so, so much for, for bringing low carb keto. Uh, I'm keto because I do a lot of intermittent fasting. I find I sleep better if I don't eat later in the day. And I have really good, I test my glucose uh, uh, occasionally just to make sure I'm staying on track. Yeah, that's really good. We're so glad that you found it. We're able to live a better quality of life where you weren't you know, yo-yoing back and forth and saying, I want to be here, but I'm not able to keep it or sustain it. And um, it's so interesting, the conversation about food addiction, and especially Joan talks about processed food addiction and how it activates those pleasure centers in your brain and makes you want to do it more. It also desensitizes them to the other things in your life that you know you might be able to enjoy pleasure from so we see you on instagram i see you on instagram and facebook posting about you know going for long walks on the beach we're here in san diego so you're able to do that almost year round even if it's a cold stormy day but um the things that um dr robert Sivas talks about um you know the emotional buoyancy um and doing things that you love to do, and it, it, even if it's a creative outlet or, a, you know, just almost like a distraction technique, I suppose he talks about going out for a walk and will get you to doing something, painting or whatever you enjoy doing, artsy, that gets you to stop thinking about what is that next thing I'm going to put in my mouth, right? Absolutely. And I find I can do things of photography, walking at the beach, getting outside, even if I'm home, I might uh, distract myself a little, little bit, uh, computer games on my phone, as long as it doesn't keep me from sleeping, then, or maybe a little bit of junk TV, uh, again, as long as it doesn't interfere with my sleep, and I'm finding I'm able to uh, relax and de-stress that way, and uh, I think those are key habits of self-soothing without uh, using food to, to, to numb up, and uh, it's just... Uh, it's a whole better life, and it just saves me a lot of money. My daughter is in her second year of college, and I'm able to to help with financially afford to get her through, and, and along with other family members. And I think that if I had stayed on the path I was on, I'm afraid my own health care bills would have taken over. And I just feel like I'm more present when I'm with family and friends, and especially my daughter when she comes home from college. <laughs> So uh, I, I think that uh, the abstaining, it's, it was hard. I know I hear people, I want everybody to know that you, know, you might have cravings for two or three days. Oh, you might have cravings for two or three months. But for me, it was more like two or three years. So I want everybody to know out there that there are tools that they can use. There's coaching you can get, um, that there are people out there who can help you. And also that there are people out there every single day that uh, you know, I won't be eating any junk at my Thanksgiving meal, and I don't, I don't like turkey so much. Like so I grab a really nice brisket from Lazy Acres down in uh, Encinitas, and I bring enough to share with family, and uh, it's great. I just have to remind people, hey, don't cut off the fat cap on that brisket because if it's a little too much, I can just render it down. But <laughs> they all laugh at me, but um, it really just is a whole. A whole new life and and I'm very appreciative of it yeah that's a really good point um we really want to enjoy our family through the holidays we may not get this podcast out just before Thanksgiving but everybody will know we record it it's great because it's actually 
always a really good reminder. We just make substitutes in what we eat. And people yeah. will say and it's, it's still, so restrictive and it's not, you know, it's still good, right? You do some coaching, right? Well, I don't ha do any formal coaching, although uh, one of the things I know Dr. Ifland talks about is that you need to, when you're going into recovery, you need, it's almost like needing new friends if you're, around friends that are doing drugs, let's say, you need to form a new community around people who have a stain. So I have on my blog, I have regular readers that I, I correspond with All right. or that will message back and forth of support. Also, if something gets really stressful for me, like if a parent gets sick or something just really upsetting happens, um, because now that I'm over 50, I do have friends, family, coworker who, who are passing away because I'm just of that age. And, um, if something upsetting like, like that happens, I can reach out to somebody that, uh, on my blog and I have enough friends now in, in other places, say like in New Zealand, that if, it, if everybody in California is asleep, she's usually awake. So <laughs> Always so someone can, to talk to. Okay, so 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 most of the help that you're giving other people is basically through your blog, right? Yes, through my blog and then through Instagram quite quite a bit. I'll put Instagram messages up about how to render fat, things like that. Okay. And that allows people who might be going through the same thing I went through to connect with someone who's living and doing it. Okay, so um, to finish off then, why don't you tell people how they can connect with you, where to find your blog and where to get hold of you on Instagram. And we'll put it in the show notes as well. Great. The best place to contact me is uh, probably Instagram, Karen's Paleo Life. So at Karen's Paleo Life. You'll be excited to hear Amy Berger has agreed to come to San Diego next year. Oh, I'm so glad it's on my bucket list to actually meet her. So, yeah. and I know she wants to meet me. So I'm really excited. Yeah. Right. Excellent. Are you garden girl or are you paleo um, on Twitter? On Twitter, I'm garden girl underscore KP uh, is my Twitter handle. And so I'm pretty active there. You can tweet me up as long as you stay, you know, I know Twitter is, it can be a, a difficult place to be, but it's fast and it's easy and to read a little blurb and I can, and I just love the links that are posted by the, my low carb favorites. Yeah, it's a, actually a good recommendation to stay out of some of the Twitter wars. If you find it a negative place to be, a little toxic sometimes, I actually avoid some of the things where people are kind of arguing with each other um, and going to the ones that stay more positive. Um, mm -hmm. We try to do that here at Low Carb USA where education and support and not attacking of anybody's lifestyle. So that's Absolutely. Good. And just one uh, other aside is that just because I'm in recovery and I abstain from something like nuts, uh, some people can have nuts when they're in their recovery and be just fine and not overeat on them. And yeah. for me, I can do 85% chocolate, a small amount every day and just be totally fine, but other people can't. So everybody's recovery pro program and plan, it should be individualized. And, and just, you have to, I think honesty is the best thing. If you're very honest with, if you're overeating, I promise myself, if I overeat on chocolate, I would just get it out of the house completely. So, uh, so far so good. I've been able to include that. But if a day comes where that doesn't happen, then I have no problem throwing it out. Yeah, that's another good point. Quickly, um, before we end, or we, we can even continue talking, maybe we'll do a bonus episode. But some people also, like Christy Sullivan has come and spoke. She does wonderful cookbooks. Um, in fact, um, I'm going to post it on my Instagram. She sent us her newest one, and it's about keto for a busy lifestyle so it's not she has a lot of very involved recipes often um but you know all those kind of comfort foods that people can many people can eat many people can make the treats and just have it and bring it to a um a holiday or have it with a family dinner um maybe some of them have to give it away so they don't bring all of it home or if they do they put it in the freezer and they can have one serving but there are other people if they have keto um, lookalikes of the, you know, sweet treat, a cake, a cookie, or anything like that, candy, they overeat it. Um, and they can't just have one bite or one half of something or one thing without wanting five. Yeah. So, um, there, everybody kind of has to do what works for them, right? There are times where I've been able to eat certain things. And then there are other times where I'm like, I haven't been able to lose the weight that I had for some reason put on even in the middle of my 
low carb ketogenic lifestyle. Um, and I found that cutting out nuts was really helpful also. Um, I didn't think I was ever going to be able to because I'm obviously addicted to nuts or, or they're very habitual for me. And sure. for some reason they have too many fat and carb combination where, especially in a nut butter, I eat like a few spoonfuls. And if you've ever made nut butter yourself, you realize how many nuts go into a very small amount of nut butter. So a teaspoon or two or three or four teaspoons really adds up to many handfuls of nuts. So that's something that I have found that I had to give up. Um, I was actually able to lose a few pounds that had been difficult for me by cutting out those nuts and decreasing some. I noticed I decreased a lot of butter actually in my diet. I might've been going over on fat. Um, so we're all learning how to play with it and uh, get it to work for us, but it's such a powerful way of living, um, cutting out sugars, grains, some dairy for people um, if that's a problematic thing and um, being able to get healthier and lose weight and live a, a better quality of life. People think we are, um, what's the word? Um, crazy. Well, besides crazy, <laughs> they think we're leading a life of deprivation when we actually have really good food and we have really great friends and we still do great things with our community and we're not, we don't feel like we're missing out. So anyway, yeah. thanks again for joining us, Karen. It was so nice to have you and sharing your story for, to help more people. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Doug and Pam. I appreciate it too. Thanks for sharing my story and, and just please know if you know, you're in the cycle of food addiction, it's not your fault. And there's, there can be relief. It's a lot of work, but it's so worth it. Yeah, awesome. and reach out to Karen. She'll be uh, glad to give you some resources that can help. You've been listening to an episode of the Low Carb USA podcast. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash USA.